Hi, welcome to the Bridge Podcasts. We hope you enjoy the following message. For more information on all that's happening at the Bridge Church, please visit www.bridge-church.com. If you can understand my accent, it's a little bit Scottish, but it's predominantly Australian, Greek kind of mixture. But uh, it is uh, great to be here. And it's my first visit to Scotland. And uh, it looks like I'll have this visit on my own. By the time my wife gets here, we'll be heading to Ghana for the uh, Iron Sharpens Iron Conference. But uh, just driving from Glasgow, I had to go to Glasgow Airport to pick up the car, then driving here. Beautiful areas. So I'm looking forward to visiting the south and visiting the north and, and uh, having a few days holiday before we hit Ghana. Um, so it is a joy to to uh, come here and share with you. It was terrific to have uh, um, your pastors with us in April to share in our three services in the morning. They did three, and um, so uh, uh, it's uh, great that I can somehow return the favour and endeavour to bless you in Christ's name and to open up God's Word to you. Um, I said, my wife... um, uh, well, I don't know how long she'll be there, but she also has to get a visa to go to Ghana, so she's got to go to the Ghana embassy as well, so it might be a couple of days. But uh, I have four children, they're all growing up, uh, 35 to uh, 29, I had four kids under five years of age, don't recommend that, and I have six grandchildren, uh, I've ordered 12, but two of my kids are not married yet, and so... Uh, so life is good when you've hit your 60s, I reckon. I reckon life just begins. And uh, so... Uh, actually, 60s is the, the new 40, isn't it? Isn't that right? And um, so we don't head for re- retirement at all. We, we actually are heading for refirement. So the older you get, the more fired up you go, because you realise you've got less years ahead of you, so you want to make the most of every opportunity that you have in, in ministering in Christ's name. And so this morning, I want to share on the, the, the question or the thought, the kind of faith that Jesus looks for. He wants all of us to be people of faith. In Luke 18, 8, he commends a woman. She's a persistent, prayerful widow who just wouldn't give up. In fact, she was a pain in the neck to the judge that she was harassing. She was seeking justice, and the guy couldn't give two hoots for justice and mercy, and she was banging his door down and was a literal pain in the neck, and Jesus commended her and said, that woman is expressing a tenacity of faith that I like. And he, and he kind of cries out in Luke 18, 8, after the Son of Man comes, will he find faith in the earth? Jesus looks for this in you and in me and collectively in our churches, this church here, my church in, in Adelaide, South Australia. In Hebrews eleven six, God's Word says, and without faith, it is impossible to please God because anyone who comes to Him must believe that He exists and that He rewards those who earnestly seek Him. Now, what a challenge (laughs) to us individually and corporately as a church. So, what's the kind of faith that Jesus looks for? Good question. What's the kind of faith that Jesus looks for? Well, there's a a powerful story, a a miracle story in the Gospels that expresses what this faith looks like. And I've been inspired by this story for 44 years I've been in the faith, and I never get sick of actually reading it. It's in Mark chapter 2. In fact, let's read the whole thing together because I don't want to just pick one verse out. But it's, it's a wonderful story. A few days later, when Jesus again entered Capernaum, remember, Capernaum was his new home. Nazareth, he was brought up in, but he had to leave Nazareth, and one of the major reasons he left Nazareth is the people wouldn't believe. 
and uh, they just were filled with doubt and cynicism and fear and misunderstanding, misapprehension, and uh, they basically tied the hands of Jesus up, and he couldn't do hardly any miraculous works in Nazareth. So he finds a new home in Capernaum, and uh, these folks believed. <laughs> a few days later, when Jesus had gone into Capernaum, the people heard that he had come home, so that's why it says it's his home. They gathered in such large numbers that there was no room left, not even outside the door, and he preached the word to them. So imagine this place chock-a-block full, not, a, not even standing room, and the crowds are outside and they're listening to the Word of God that He was speaking and preaching. Some men came, bringing to Him a paralyzed man, carried by four of them. Fantastic four. <laughs> Since they could not get Him to Jesus because of the crowd, they made an opening in the roof above Jesus by digging through it and then lowered the mat the man was lying on. Unbelievable. They wrecked the house to get this guy to Christ. And it says, when Jesus, say it with me, saw their faith, he said to the paralyzed man, son, your sins are forgiven. Some teachers of the law were sitting there thinking to themselves, why does this fellow talk like that? He's blaspheming. Who can forgive sins but God alone? Precisely. Immediately, Jesus knew in his spirit that this was what they were thinking in their hearts. And he said to them, why are you thinking these things? Which is easy to say to this paralyzed man, your sins are forgiven, or to say, get up, take your mat and walk. But I want you to know that the Son of Man has authority on earth to forgive sins. So he said to the man, I tell you, get up, take your mat and go home. And he got up, took his mat and walked out in full view of them all. This amazed everyone and they praised God saying, we have never seen anything like this. That's the understatement of the year. We have never seen anything like this. So it says, when Jesus saw their faith, whose faith? The paralyzed man? No, I don't, we don't, doesn't say anything about him. But the four guys who were bringing this paralyzed, needy man to Jesus. What did Jesus see in these four men? He's looking, he's observing, and he's saying, I like what I see. I like what I see. So you can smell faith, you can see faith, you can feel faith. You sense it, you know it when it's there, and Jesus got really excited about these four guys. He got excited about uh, others as well, like remember the centurion, the Italian centurion, and the Greeks, or the, the sorrow Phoenician woman, the, the, the Italian centurion, he had a servant that was really ill. The sorrow Phoenician woman, who was not Jewish, so she was outside the covenant people, and the, this Italian kind of centurion was part of the colonizing power, so he really wasn't a very popular guy. But uh, Jesus loved that man and loved that woman, and, and it's the only times when he actually honoured two pagans and said, I've never seen such great faith in the whole of Israel. Not just ordinary faith, but great faith. Because he saw in them a love and a heart towards needy and troubled people. And so he is a centurion that cares for his servant. Here is a woman that is caring and is so troubled by her daughter. And it's, it's interesting where he commends great faith, it, it's where people are exercising faith on behalf of another person. It's what we call vicarious faith. And, and there's something pure about vicarious faith. When you're praying for people outside of your own family, when you're ministering to people who are out there, because there's no self-interest involved. And so Jesus looked at the centurion, he looked at the Syrophoenician, because I haven't seen such faith, a great faith. So when he sees it, he honours it. And here he sees great faith. And, and, he, and he says, look, when, I, when he saw their faith, when he, he kind of was taken aback, he said to the paralytic, and the power of God flowed in that man's life. 
And not only was he physically healed, but he was spiritually restored as well. And so, what did Jesus see in these four men? He saw a Bible-honoring faith that really believes that God is good, loving, and merciful. He saw a faith that fully relies and, and wholeheartedly trusts in God's faithfulness to come through for needy and hurting people. He saw a dependence upon God and His Word that involves the totality of one's being. That's what he saw. So let's break this faith down into its four constituent parts. Firstly, compassion. That's what he saw. Love in action. He saw and read the guy's hearts, their motives, their feelings, he saw four men that loved their mate so much that they were prepared to do an extraordinary thing, destroy a house. Was Jesus commending the destruction of a house? I don't think so. I reckon at the end of the day, he probably would have pulled out some money, would have said to Judas Iscariot, hey, open up and get some money out and give it to these people. Let's get this place fixed up. Jesus had plenty of money, you realise that, don't you? He was bankrolled by uh, several millionaire women and uh, who he had delivered from demons and got them healed and uh, they kind of just said, you know what, we're going to use our wealth, our resources to finance this ministry. And so for three years they bankrolled Jesus and his men and, his, and their wives and kids and food and clothing and lodging. You can read about it in Luke 8, chapter 1, it says these women, one of them was in Herod's own family, the king's. And so uh, Jesus, just, I'm sure, <laughs> he would have said to, to the guys, come on, let's give some money to, to, to fix up this problem. He wasn't commanding the destruction of a facility, but he loved what he saw within the hearts of these guys because Jesus was deeply moved by compassion for people in need. And he so wants us to be like him. You can track it in the four Gospels. Time and time again, Jesus' miraculous power flows through the conduit of compassion as he felt for people, as he really was concerned for them, as something stirred in his inner being. Compassion is, is a Greek word that says, out of your guts, out of the explagia in here, kind of deep feeling. It's not just saying, oh yeah, I feel for that person, oh, a little bit of sympathy. It's like deep feeling, sympathy, pain, identifying, empathy that leads to action. Whenever it says Jesus was full of compassion, he always did something didn't just say, he actually did something to alleviate the pain and to heal a hurt, to, 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 to solve a problem, to deliver a person of a demon, to get them physically healed, get them spiritually restored. He always took action or provided food and resources to be able to help people. There's a great little statement in Paul's letter to the Galatians, Galatians 5, 6, and uh, it, it's such an insightful little truth because as I was reading Galatians and reflecting on, on this, you, you, Paul is dealing with religious, pharisaical attitudes among Christians. And you know, should people be circumcised when they come to faith or should they not? And there was huge division in the church and in particularly in the Galatian church and he kind of cries out, and he says, for in Christ, neither circumcision nor uncircumcision has any value. The only thing that counts, hear this, the only thing that counts is faith expressing itself through love. Faith works or is expressed through love. You can't say, I love Jesus or I, I, am having, I depend upon him, I trust him and hate people. You can't say, oh, I'm worshipping God, I just have such faith, I put my faith in Him. The more you put your faith in Him, the more we actually see it outworked by loving relationships among people. The vertical exp must express itself through the horizontal. That's why Paul says, the only thing that counts is faith working through love. And Jesus saw in these four guys, faith working through love. The compassion, love in action, hearts being moved. I've just come back from Madagascar and one of our board members on the Healing Jesus board is, is a young man who started a movement in Madagascar and it's just amazing what's taking place. I mean, he started it in his late 20s, it's 11 years old, this movement. 
There are probably 25 to 30,000 people that have come to Christ and the main church has around 11,000 people in Antanarivo and I've been there twice now and it's just a privilege to go and, and, and to serve and the things that you see are just remarkable and I was reflecting on it and just talking to the Lord about the, what I was seeing there, I've been there twice and the, the miracles that are taking place there are quite remarkable, quite astounding. And, and one of the reasons I felt God is doing something remarkable there is because the, the people are so poor, so poor and so, so needy, troubled. When my wife came the first time, we ministered to an AIDS, a family with AIDS, and they'd come to Christ and the little girl was obviously dying of AIDS, a three or four-year-old little kid. So my wife is a nurse educator at the university. She picked it quick, smart, and uh, saying something's wrong here. Little girl died within six weeks when we returned. And, uh, and there were no drugs for her. And Kathy says, you don't have to die of, of the HIV virus. There are medications and they're not that expensive. And, uh, and so her heart was broken because she ministered this little kid and felt, look, you know, what, what, what could take place? You know, Madagascar has the same population as Australia, 24 million people. My state of South Australia has 1.7 million. So it's a small state, huge geographical area. And uh, so South Australia has 1.7 million. Madagascar has 24 million. The gross domestic product of Madagascar is 35 billion. The gross domestic product of South Australia, 1.7 million, is nearly $100 billion. So Adelaide, South Australia, is a really wealthy place compared. I'm thinking, 1.7 million, a $100 billion economy, 24, billion, 24 million, and it's like one third the size. So there's no medicines and there's no... They've only got God. And so I think it's not because they've got greater faith than us, I looked at it's, it's how the people operated and some of them were, were very religious and uh, a bit extreme and, and a bit confused and their doctrines a bit all over the place. But I think, why are there such significant outpourings of the Spirit of grace, of salvation and healing? It's because God loves people and they've got nothing else. They've got no other hope outside of Jesus Christ and so they just and I think God just just throws his mercy upon those kinds of of people and um, and it's not that they've got greater faith than us I just think the need is so huge and his compassion and heart for these people I'll never forget a, um, a woman that used to come to the church and she was a hopeless alcoholic and you know smoking like a chimney and drugs and alcohol and um and every so often every year or so she'd come to the church when she's really sick so she wasn't really part of the community she's not oh, my church is a christian family center when she was drunk she'd ring me up at two or three in the morning and abuse me and the next day she'd she'd, she'd apologize and so she'd come forward for prayer almost every time she came forward for prayer she got healed she got healed half schlozzled and some of our fine Christian people, full of faith and pure as can be and living, struggling to find healing. And it troubled me. And I thought, and I was a younger pastor, I thought, God, how come she? Like, yeah, and what about them? And, and then I understood something. The Lord showed me a picture of her life, rejected by her daddy when she was a little kid, raped when she was 13, abusive husband, who forced her to have an abortion when, when uh, uh, she was in her early 20s. Just a broken human being. And she turned to the grog and, and the drugs to anaesthetise the pain in her life. And it's not that God is condoning bad behaviour or taking that kind of stuff, but he loved her. So every time she would just reach out just a little bit, she would heal her. He would heal her. It's not that somehow... We need to be punishing ourselves that we don't have enough faith. Folks, what we need is a heart of compassion for lost people. The more loving we can be, the irresistible 
the power of God will start flowing. Faith expresses itself through love. These guys were full of love for their mate. Simple as that. And that's what Jesus saw. Secondly, they were committed. Faith in action, our will. Not only were their hearts touched, deep, deep feeling, but their wills, they had an iron will. They were determined. And uh, uh, these four guys were prepared to get involved. They rolled up their sleeves. They were doers of the word of Jesus and not just passive hearers. They weren't just out there listening as Jesus was preaching inside. Yeah, that's a nice thought. That's a great idea. Yeah, maybe one day it's going to happen. You know, perhaps somebody else. They just said, you know what? If this is true, let's do something about it. We love our mate. We can't get him to Jesus. And so their, their will was bent towards saying, we want to take some action. And most times in the New Testament, Faith is expressed by some form of action being taken by a person who hears and receives the word of Christ. And these four guys in our story heard the word, okay, and they believed it and they took action upon it. The, the word faith in the Greek, bistevo, and I know a little bit about Greek because I was born in a Greek family, that word's not a noun. We don't think faith. Faith is actually, the Greek word bistevo is a verb. It's a doing word. It's an action word. It's not passive. It's active. And Jesus calls for a commitment. He calls for involvement. He calls for your time. And, and, and particularly when it doesn't consider one's personal convenience. <laughs> These guys were incredibly inconvenienced. And it takes faith action. I know to plant a church, uh, and, and we've, by the grace of God, uh, been able to plant uh, a stack of daughter churches. We've probably attempted 25 in the early years and, and half of them fell over, but we've got about a dozen up and running and, uh, and, and they're flowing really well and, and, and I'm more committed than ever uh, that Jesus wants to work through us to actually plant churches and to, to spread the message of the gospel. Because church planting is all about evangelism. It's going out where the unchurched are and, and, and witnessing and sharing and leading people to Christ and then forming communities who want to be part of a, a loving environment. And out of that, we produce disciples who then start doing the same thing, preaching, teaching, evangelizing. And so, uh, but our church at Seaton started with 15 teenagers in 1976. So it was, 15 teenagers. And the mother church that kind of was overseeing the plant, the, 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 the lead pastor just said, mm, I don't know about whether this group's going to go anywhere. They're pretty young, they're pretty mature. There was one grey head, he had just turned 40. He was the mature one. And that church in, in 40 years next year, again, by the grace of God, God has been able to use it to touch the lives of thousands of people. And with the mother church at Seton and the daughter churches that are all interconnected together that we've been able to start, there are now 2,500 people that are, that are meeting regularly for fellowship and sharing. And, uh, and, of course, there are so many others that we've ministered to. But to what, are, what are we among so many? Just a bunch of, just 15 teenagers. But I think, man, look at what's taken place. I look at, at Madagascar when I went there. I asked Patrick and his wife, Farah, I said, Patrick, how did you start the church? He goes, well, God told me to... to uh, there's 11,000 people there in the church. They have six serv they have nine services on a Sunday. Three in one location, six in the others. And I did from six o'clock through to 7.30 and I nearly died, one after the other. That's when I felt my age. I said, I've got to go back to the hotel. Like, this is... And anyway, so I said, Patrick, how did you start? He goes, well, God spoke to me that he wanted me to plant a church. He did a, he did a Bible college course through, on the internet. Thank God he found a good internet Bible college from the United States that wasn't wacko. There was sound theology. So he was trained well. And he goes, then I just hired a room. I might have been probably smaller than this. For me to seat 100, 150 people maybe. And he goes, and I just advertised. And my wife and I were ready. I said, what happened? She go, and he goes, no one turned up. <laughs> no one turned up. I said, what'd you do? He goes, well, 
I said, Farah, you do the songs. I'll sing in the front row. Then I'll get up and preach to you. And let's, let's do church together. They did that for the first couple of weeks. Nobody turned up. And then a lady turned up. An old woman came and they thought, revival has come. <laughs> so Jesus said, wherever two or three with his presence, and if he has called a group of people, and so what I saw in Patrick and Farah is compassion for the lost and a commitment just to go through, say, we're going to preach. And so he preached up a storm to his wife. Anyway, the next week, that woman didn't turn up, another woman turned up. This went on for the next two to three months, step by step, faith, action, commitment, love, so people see that many thousands of people now, but forget that when it started, when it started, it requires a heart of compassion for lost people and it requires a preparation to make a commitment, our will to bend, to say, God, even if it's a, uh, I've got to die to my own reputation, I'm prepared to, to go for this in Jesus' name. Thirdly, Jesus saw creativity, the spirit in action through their minds. Who gave them this crazy idea to wreck a house? I think it was the Holy Spirit. I think they had an open mind. We need to have open minds to receive the Holy Spirit's ideas and methodologies. And do you know what? What worked in the 70s when I started doesn't actually work now in 2015. When we started, we all wore suits and ties and you've got to believe we were dressed to kill. And the pastors all sat on the platform and then the pastor himself had to be the song leader. So we had our little techniques, we were trained of how to do songs. I mean, I look back now at some of the videos and I cringe! But we thought it was so cool back in the 70s. And you know what? It probably was cool back then. But imagine... If we're stuck with those methodologies in this day and age, hey, we don't change the Bible. We don't change our beliefs. They're immovable. There's a changeless center, but we've got to change everything else in our methodologies to be able to reach modern men and women today and young people today. Our music styles, our lights, our facilities, all that kind of stuff. And uh, sometimes in our church service, I think, oh man, that's just, that's just too loud. And those lights kind of, for those who were in the drug scene back in the 70s, like the psychedelic thing, like it's just a bit too much. And so the old druggies come to me and say, Bill, that was really like having an old trip, you know, back then. But we know, you know, this is, people like it today. We're not changing the message. We're not changing the Bible. We're not changing our beliefs, but we have to be relevant and culturally sensitive to where our society is at. And we've got to be open to the creativity of the Holy Spirit so these guys had open minds to receive the Holy Spirit's idea. And, and there were some problems. There were some impossibility barriers for these four guys. They just could not get into the house. And people were really selfish. Christians were really selfish. They were, they were there blocking the... They, couldn't, they didn't even see the need. Here are these four guys. I'm sure they would have said, excuse me, could you use your room? No, nah, there's no room. We're here for Jesus. They might have been well. So there's a barrier, an impossibility barrier. But you know what? These guys found a Holy Spirit-inspired solution. Never underestimate the person and work of the Holy Spirit. You read the book of Acts. What an amazing book. You take out the references to the Holy Spirit and it will just be a boring history book that'll leave you just dry. But the book of Acts is full of visions and dreams and prophecies and guidance and supernatural knowledge and wisdom and healings, the language of the Holy Spirit. And Bridge Church, can I say to you, you've been around for a long time, keep on dreaming big audacious, Jesus-honouring and people-helping dreams. What God has started with you, He wants to just see that as just the foundation for what He wants to do in these regions of Scotland. Difficulties will always arise when you're moving forward with God. 
The Bible is full of stories about how its faith heroes had to overcome various obstacles before God's miraculous flowed. Impossibilities can intimidate you. Impossibilities can frustrate you, or they can motivate you, or they can force you on your knees to pray and to seek God and to believe and to persist like that persistent widow in Luke 18 until a breakthrough comes. Jesus loves to see this, people opening themselves up to say, hey, the wine is flowing, but the old wine skin's just going to burst. You need a new wine skin to take, to conserve and to outwork the, the new wine that God wants to, to flow through you. Remember the, the story of the 12 spies? What an amazing story in Numbers 11. That's seen all the miracles. And Moses says, boys, I want you to go on a reconnaissance mission. They went there, 12 of them, top leaders. They came back and the 10 of them said, man, we are scared. We have seen some people that are giants and we seem like grasshoppers in their eyes. As if they interviewed those giants to find out what they really thought of them. And they're presenting this negative, fearful, cynical kind of, oh, we've got to go backwards, we can't move forwards, like, let's go back to Egypt, you know, and we're all going to die. <coughs> and then Caleb and Joshua, they kind of go, what? What? Did we, are we a part of the same group? Did we see the same things, same facts, different interpretation? And Joshua and Caleb said, give me a break. We're the giants, they're the grasshoppers. Let's go in there and kick some, you know what? <laughs> These are illegal trespassers that need to be evicted because God's given us the promise that that land is ours. So what do we do with demons? We cast them out in Jesus' name as we go forward preaching the gospel. And so Moses and the group were to cross that, that well Joshua led them to cross the River Jordan and to possess the land that was already theirs in Christ. <laughs> Already theirs, but now they had to, by faith, action, move forward, evict these illegal trespassers, claim and outwork the promises that God had already given to them. Man, these two faith-filled, positive faith-filled men are commended throughout Scripture. Look, every growth and development phase of our local church, and, and the Christian Family Centre is, is our church within our CRC movement, there's always needed to be a miracle for a breakthrough. I can't recall one significant development in the life of the church, whether it's buying properties or raising lots of money or planting a daughter church or sending missionaries overseas, where it required people to, to see God come through for them. Real miracles, real provisions that, that said, you know what, faith is not just theoretical. It's love in action. It's will in action, compassion, commitment. It's creativity in action, minds that are open to what God wants to do today. So I often say to our church people, hey guys, our history is rich. And I've been around for a long time. I can write up the history. I said, but really, I'm not living back in the 70s. I'm not living back in the 80s. I'm not living back in the 90s. I'm not living back in the noughties, is that what we call them, 2000s? Because people say to me, oh Bill, the church is not what it used to be and you know, it was so much nicer when we were in the grain school. And I just want to pull my hair out and scream at them and say, excuse me, listen to what you're saying. I don't say it like that, I am a more loving pastor. <laughs> I say, folks, God is alive today and I'm enjoying Him today. I'm, I'm so thankful for what, God he, what he did 10 years ago. But I don't, I don't live in the past. I'm driving. When I was driving today from, from there to here, I mean, those roads, you've got to watch the road, don't you? Like, you know, like, and imagine if I was driving, looking in the, in, in the rear vision mirror. Woo! Hey, the rear vision mirror is for you to look at from time to time to get your bearings, where you've come from. But you've got to look out the big open window with vision and faith and confidence, enjoying the scenery and watching out for oncoming traffic and that's coming before you. It's like trying to drive the car in reverse gear. You can't do that. You've got to go forward. 
got to be looking out the window and put a first, second, third. Imagine if you look in the rear vision mirror, reversing backwards, you're going to end up hitting everything. You know, you've lost your way. It's a sign of losing our first love and understanding what church is all about and why we are what we are as the people of God. There are thousands of lost people right around these towns. There's some big towns around here. They need Jesus Christ. I know Scotland's not a very, not a high proportion of people go to church. So what? Jesus can touch them. When we went to the western suburbs of Adelaide, one of the, the elders, a couple of the elders of this great Pentecostal church said, well, we actually tried the western suburbs 10 years ago. Didn't work. Working class people, you know, kind of like, they just like to smoke and drink. And, and it was a real negative kind of statement because the, this church we came from was fairly upper middle class professional. I said, oh, that... And we were put off from actually going into the western suburbs because that's a hard area. Hey, listen, there ain't no too hard area for God. There's no too hard baskets for God. Hey, remember the, the revival in Acts chapter 8? That was the hard area. When Philip went to Samaria. There's a natural antipathy between Jews and Samaritans. And not just that, he goes into an area that was controlled by a warlock, a master warlock who controlled the people through occult power. He goes straight into that area. Interesting, he doesn't try and map it out and say, mm, I wonder how many demons are there and we should go for six months of intercession before we go. And he just went in there preaching Jesus. Preaching Jesus, the answer. And when demons raised their head, he just stomped on them. Amen. It was a difficult area. Simon Magus was a really difficult person. But a great breakthrough occurred. The first breakthrough after Jerusalem in an area where people said it's too hard, in an area where, oh, it's, these people are just, you know, they're into the occult. Jesus can do stuff, and he loves to do it, in areas that just, when we see, we see it, we say, you know what, it, it actually is only God. It's not us. And so, guys, your best days are ahead of you. They really are. Finally, cooperation. <laughs> Unity of action. Oh, this is our team, our local church body. This is where teamwork and loyalty are so important. You see, these four guys work unitedly together as a team because they had a common purpose. It would not have been easy for them. There was a cost factor. There was a price to pay in what they did. And they would not have achieved this miraculous result on their own. They needed each other. You think about it. One person couldn't have done it. It required four of them. They had to dismantle the roof. Then the guys on a mat, how the heck they did that? They must have cut the ropes to the right, the right size. and that, that, There was quite a bit of engineering involved here. Imagine if the rope was a bit too long. Oh, here he comes, Timber! And he falls on Jesus. That would have been something, wouldn't have it? I mean, it required forethought. It required them cooperating together, thinking together, working together as a team because they had a common purpose. It was no longer one person's agenda. or two. It needed the four of them. They needed four ropes. They needed to lower this guy down. See, love for the guy propelled them to work together in unity. Working together as the body of Christ at times is not easy. But folks, we have and will continue to achieve far more together than on our own. We are exhorted by Paul. How many times does he say to us, make every effort to keep the unity of the Holy Spirit through the bond of peace, making yourself a willing prisoner of peace for the cause sake in Ephesians 4, 1 to 3. And he says something similar in Philippians 2, 1 to 5, the great kenosis passage, when he says, look at Jesus, learn from him, humble yourselves, work together. These guys 
worked unitedly, cooperated together, and working unitedly together with a loving and humble heart is God's way. The opposite is opening up of the devil's influence. You think about that. If there's not love flowing and if there's pride, we are opening ourselves up to the devil's influence. The church is, is Christ's body. We've got to love it. We've got to respect it. We've got to be loyal to it. It requires a servanthood attitude, a dying to self, a living for God and a loving of others. Jesus was prepared to pay the full price. No cost was too high for him to purchase your eternal salvation. And there, is no, there was no room in his heart for the baser things of life. He served. He humbled himself. And he says, follow my example. Folks, there's no room. There should be no room in our hearts for offences. Resentment, bitterness, anger. It wasn't in Jesus' heart because he was so preoccupied with loving others and serving others and giving to others, not thinking of himself. These four guys, their agenda was the church's agenda. They work together in love and unity and nothing will wreck the momentum of a church moving forward and griping and, and negativity and grumbling and criticism and, and unfounded criticisms at times. And every so often in the life of the Christian Family Centre, I think, where did that come from? What is going on here? Like, and I think, where, where, where self comes to the throne and Jesus comes off the throne of people's hearts and they want to put him back on a cross. It's like, you're meddling now, Jesus, living in my heart. See, if he's really enthroned in our hearts, he's going to meddle with our lives. And he's going to touch every aspect, how you conduct your marriage, how you raise your kids, how you walk in love and unity with, with, with people, your gentleness, your humility, your witness, how, what the community thinks of you. So... so so every so often in, in the life of the church at times, people dethrone Christ from their hearts and put him back on a cross and then they think, okay, it's time for me to run the church. Jesus is the living head of his church and he leads it through the Holy Spirit, through the God-appointed leaders and ministries that he places there. And, and that's something that's for godly order to flow. And so in my local church, every so often... It happens, and some of my team get, get a bit shaky. They go, oh, you know, there's criticism and there's negativity, and I just listen to them because they're younger pastors, and they get so affected, and I say, oh, welcome to real life, guys. <laughs> welcome to real living. Now, what are you going to do about it? <laughs> Have you got the courage to tap somebody on the shoulder and say, you know what? It's time for you to move on. I want to bless you. And help you to find a church that will suit your personality type. Because <laughs> it ain't working here. <laughs> and they, oh, you can't do that. Of course you can. You can do it in love. So <laughs> my wife runs our kitchen ministry, and Bernie's seen it. And it, I mean, it's, it's a wonderful minute. They have lunch every Sunday. There's about 60 workers. There's, I think, six teams of 10, and they cook the food and they sell it for $5 or something and three for the kids. They still make a profit. Can you believe it? Anyway, so we get people coming in, and, and one, Kathy's leading one of the teams, and, and so the kitchen, when they came in on the Sunday morning, was a pigsty. And so it was like, wow, who used it the night before? You know what the rules are. The rules are you use it, you clean it, and have it ready. You know? So anyway, so this lady, she was new to the church, well, she did her nana. She did everything but swear. Those young people, and she really started blasting about the young people in the church. And everyone kind of froze because it was like, wow, where'd that come from? That's not our culture. And so Kathy just goes, goes out to Butsar and says, you know what? We don't talk about our young people like that. And she looked at and says, you know, we really love our young people. And we're so thankful that they can use the kitchen and use the church 
yeah, I know that sometimes they cross a line. It's a bit like in our homes. Because I'll talk to them. You know, but, you know, this is how we behave. And everyone in the kitchen realised, hey. So she was able to correct her in a loving way. Because when you've got a good, strong culture, culture attracts and culture rejects. And if that woman did not change her attitude, and she did, that we love our young people and we want them in church and we don't mind if they pick the place up and we're going to train them and help them to be more responsible. That's a, that's a value that we have. There's no place for her in the life of the Christian Family Centre if she hates young people. So we would actually encourage her to move on and find a church that hates young people. <laughs> and I remember a couple in our staff meeting again with our younger pastors and, and they're talking about this guy and his wife said, man, he's, you know, he's going to, I think we can use him in this area and that area. And I just was sitting there kind of, should I say it or should I not say it? And I said, oh, look, I don't think you can use him in this leadership role. Why, Bill? I said, oh, because he's on his way out. And, they, and a couple of them just put their pen down and go, how do you know that? Out of how do you know he's on his way out? It caught me by surprise. There was like a bit of frustration. No, it, was, it was respectful frustration. How do you know these things? I'm like, well, it's not rocket science. I said, look at his track record. He's come from three different churches and every time he spat the dummy, why do you think he's not going to do it with us? Unless he turns to God, the God of the second chance, repents, puts his trust in God, goes back to those churches and puts the things right. So firstly, I said, secondly, the only reason he's in the church is because every Sunday he bails you up. I spoke to one of the pastors and, he, and before the service and after the service, you're talking to him for half an hour. Meanwhile, we've got 30, 40 new visitors coming through. He's manipulating and controlling your time. And, and, and like he says, I, I don't know how to get out of that. He said to me, the pastor, I don't know. I said, I said, you stop talking to him on a Sunday and say, if you need to talk to me, you can do it during the week or after when everyone goes, then we can just have a cup of coffee. I said, the only reason he's in the church is because he thinks he's going to get somewhere because of his connection with you. I said, and meanwhile, you're being hindered from talking to the visitors and ministering to other people. And so anyway, so I just gave him basic evidence. You know, just, it wasn't rocket science. I said, just, just watch and observe. Because I know how the devil works. I've been around long enough to be able to smell demons, particularly religious demons, when they try and work through pride and arrogance and conceit and break the unity of the Spirit. Hey, Jesus saw these guys and he says, I love the faith that I see. And you know why? Because I see you cooperating together. I see you working as a team. And that's what God wants to do in and through us, to build us as a team. That's the kind of faith. Now, how does the story end? Okay. Well, Jesus was heavily criticised by the Pharisees. And criticism, misunderstanding and misinformation is inevitable when you're moving forward in faith. But Jesus does a beautifully complete work by healing the man both inside and outside in response to the four men's faith. Jesus touches both the man's soul and body because both were paralysed. He saw what others couldn't see. And where the, this kind of faith that Jesus sees, there's no limits. This guy came and those four brought him so he could be physically healed. But Jesus said, you know what you need, son? You need spiritual cleansing. You need your soul to be saved. You need to be reconciled to a loving father. Your sins are stopping you. So, son, your sins are forgiven you. Jesus gets down to the root cause of the real issues of life. And when there's a spirit of faith operating, it's like a lightning rod for his presence. And his presence will do things that we can't even see in transforming human hearts. This guy's heart was transformed way before his body was healed. Hey, what's more important? 
The healing of the body or the healing of the soul? Really the healing of the soul. Because we're all going to die of something, aren't we? We're not going to live forever and ever in this physical body. So as much as we believe in healing and we pray for the sick every week and we get some good results as well, we also know that sooner or later we're going to conk out and we're going to go and be with the Lord. Okay? So if, if you're only born once, you will die twice. But if you're born twice, you're only going to die once. So we say the most important thing is to be born from above, to have your soul cleansed, guilt removed, restored to the Father through the dying of Christ on a cross for the sins of humanity. We say to people, be reconciled, turn to Jesus Christ and you will live forever and ever. That's the number one thing. And as a, as a strong Pentecostal, and I believe Jesus as the Saviour, healer, baptizer in the Holy Spirit, giver of gifts, soon coming King. But the number one thing is that He is the Saviour of our souls. And the number one evidence of a church that's moving forward in faith is when people are coming to Christ and people are being restored back to the Father. But that's the greatest sign of all. That's the number one sign. That is much harder for God to do. The, 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 the healing of a soul, the changing of a heart, than the raising even of the dead. You can bring 10 dead bodies out here. And if God raises them up, okay, God be glorified. But it's much easier for God to raise 10 dead bodies than to, to, than to transform 10 deceitful, stubborn, conceited human hearts because the dead offer no resistance whereas living breathing human beings that have sinned and cover their sins and have got guilt and fear and shame and and defense mechanisms the holy spirit it's a much greater miracle to break through all those defense mechanisms until ultimately the human heart says yes i'm a sinner and i need a savior <laughs> that's the hardest thing of all i remember one of our old guys, he's old now, but when he came, his wife got saved and he was so resentful. He was a smoking, drinking, foul mouthed guy. And he says, What's this crazy church that you're joining to now? You know, like, I'm going to drop you off. Then I'm going to pick you up. Be out there by 12 o'clock or else that's it. So he'd drop her off and then he'd drop her off. He's got to go. Boom, and he's out there, smoke pouring out the car. In she goes, zoom, off he goes. This went on for a few months. And then we noticed him parking at the far end of the car park. You can see it because smoke's pouring out the car. He's got his cans of beer and he's kind of like smoking. And, 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 so, and then she'd have to walk to the car. That went on for about a, a month or two. And then he would get out of the car and just start walking a little bit, puffing away, giving the vibe like, just get out of my space. Don't even talk to me. But gradually, the walks, he started walking closer to the church and one of our guys, Jimmy, one of our men, just started befriending him. He didn't say to him, turn or burn. He didn't just didn't kind of say, look. He just defriended him and became, just became a, identified him as a friend. And then one day, that man did a very foolish thing. He put out his cigarette and he came and stood at the back of the church. Then... He sat in the back, but oh, the vibes were still like this. <laughs> Keep away, all except Jimmy. Anyway, so one particular Sunday, <laughs> the mess, the God was moving just beautifully. And Jimmy goes up to him, taps him on the shoulder and says, Colin, don't you think it's time? And with that, he just burst into tears, fell into his arms, weeping his way into the kingdom of God as he came out the front, like, literally like convulsing as he's coming forward to give his life for Christ. What is that? That's the God of grace that can take a hard heart and gradually make it a soft heart where the person recognizes their sin and they turn from it and he ends up becoming a great missionary supporter. And he would go to short-term mission seedings. He's gone to be with the Lord now. But I look at that man's life and I think, man, that's what it's all about. How many of them are out there? Do not think they're too hard. God can do anything. This guy, how do we know what his deep needs were? 
Jesus, in fact, ignores the physical healing and says, man, you need spiritual healing. You need psychological restoration. You need to be reconciled. There's some stuff going down there. Boy, you've sinned, man, haven't you? Like, the guy didn't resist it. He says, son, your sins, <laughs> you've sinned. They need forgiving. I'm sure the guy's going, well, how did you know? You know? <laughs> and then he gets healed. The issue of sin in our broken relationship with God the Father is Jesus' number one priority. All needs lead to this. And maybe today, you need forgiveness of sins in your life. Maybe this message is just being geared for you. That you're looking to God to provide some answers in different areas. But he's actually saying, son, I'm allowing these things. Daughter, I'm allowing these things to take place to get your attention. Because the greater need is, I want your heart. Your heart is far from me. I need to soften it. I want to knock off the barnacles and the hardness and soften it and let my spirit kind of make it malleable so you respond to me in true worship and learn how to love and forgive and walk in right relationships. If that's you... Give your heart to Christ today. Maybe you've been a believer, but you're not walking with him as you should. Or maybe you have never given your life to Christ. Give your life over to Jesus today. Or maybe you are saying, I don't, I've never really understood this stuff about faith, but now you see it. It's about compassion. It's about commitment. It's about creativity. It's about cooperation. And as you look at that, at the, the, the prism of what Jesus sees when he saw their faith, what does he see in you? What dimension? You say, you know what? I need to seek Jesus on this one to ensure that the faith that's flowing out of my heart is the kind of faith that's going to turn Jesus on, that's going to say, wow. I haven't seen such great faith for a long time. Thanks for listening. Remember to visit our website, www.bridge-church.com and connect with us via Facebook and Twitter.